Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today for this Facebook Live coronavirus special. I do apologize to those of you that have been hanging uh, on the line waiting for us to start. We've had a couple of technical hitches uh, working between Zoom and Facebook. So hopefully that is now all resolved for everybody. And uh, on to the subject of the day. As we all know, colorectal cancer doesn't stop for this virus. And many of us in the colorectal cancer community are facing tough questions about whether to risk virus exposure and stay the course with treatments or screening or to stay at home, hopefully avoiding the virus, but delaying vital screening or treatment services. Just this morning, the Texas Tribune is one of many publications running features with the question, cancel chemo or risk compromised immune systems. I think that's front of mind. As a stage four survivor myself, uh, who's recently joined the team at Fight CRC, I'm still in treatment. And these are certainly the questions at the front of my mind. So I'm Scott Wilson, Mission Champion VP at Fight CRC, and I'm delighted to share the Facebook Live stage today with Dr. Rich Goldberg, internationally renowned GI expert, who will help us navigate some of these tough questions. Now, before I ask you to say a few words of introduction, Dr. Goldberg, I do have some big Fight CRC news to share with our viewers today. You've accepted an invitation to join the Fight CRC board, which is wonderful news. We're absolutely delighted to welcome you to the family, though I know the organization's far from you to you. Clearly the noise around the virus has slightly taken the shine off your arrival, but I hope you'd be able to share some of your incoming board thoughts along with your general introduction. Do Dr. Goldberg. Well, thank you, Scott, and thank you everybody for participating. Uh, I'm actually not new to fight CRC. I've been on the medical advisory board for uh, many years. Uh, and was one of the people that helped to identify Angie Davis as a potential uh, player for fight uh, colorectal cancer. My background is that uh, I just retired after 35 years as a GI oncologist. Uh, I worked at uh, Mayo Clinic uh, in Rochester, Minnesota for 10 winters, uh, running the uh, GI cancer program there. Uh, also, while I was there, I ran the North Central Cancer Treatment Group a GI Committee, which is one of the NCI-funded uh, clinical trials groups. Uh, when I left there, I went to the University of North Carolina, became the uh, first physician and chief of the North Carolina Cancer Hospital. Also, during that time, became the GI chair for the Alliance for Clinical Trials in Oncology. Uh, clinical trials group, and I still serve as the associate uh, chair of the alliance uh, currently. Uh, I've done uh, research in colorectal cancer. Uh, I did the study that led to the licensing of oxaliplatin in the U.S. Uh, and its uh, use around the world uh, in, in collaboration uh, with Amory de Gramont, who developed the full fox regimen in France. Uh, and have run phase one through three uh, clinical trials looking at new drugs. Uh, my other interest is in inherited cancer susceptibilities. Uh, and uh, now that I've recently retired as the director of the West Virginia University Cancer Institute, I have more time for activities like this. That's a great introduction. On behalf of all the oxyplatin Patients, many thank you for, uh, thanks for what, what you've contributed. So uh, now to the Q&A. We do have a range of questions from the Fight CRC community, <clears throat> all related to concerns we might be having about immunosuppression and the impact of the coronavirus crisis on screening, treatment or surgery. Clearly immunosuppression is the word of the month for cancer patients at the moment. So I thought perhaps we should start there and just ask you to say a little bit about what being immunocompromised really means in a world facing coronavirus. So Dr. Goldberg. Well, so the first thing I'm gonna say is that I'm giving advice in a general way and I'm not meaning to give advice to anybody specifically about what you should individually do. Uh, that really is a conversation between you and your medical team. Uh, what I can do is to try and give you some information and perhaps to help you frame some questions to ask your providers. Uh, but I'm not going to be telling you what you should or shouldn't do because I don't know your particular story. So the issue with immunosuppression is that uh, 
chemotherapy is what we call cytotoxic therapy. That means it kills cells. Uh, and it kills cells by interfering with the mechanism by which they divide. The trouble is that not just cancer cells are dividing in our body, many other cells are dividing as well. And we recognize that in GI cancer, uh, with some of the side effects of chemotherapy, those side effects can include lowering of the white blood count, which is the infection fighting cells that the bone marrow is producing. Uh, the bone marrow produces cells very rapidly, and the most sensitive cells in the body to chemotherapy are rapidly growing cells. We also can sometimes see that because the lining of the mouth and the GI tract have cells that are rapidly replenishing and sometimes we'll get mouth sores or diarrhea uh, or other problems uh, that are related to the effects of chemotherapy. Uh, and as anyone who's taken chemotherapy knows that chemotherapy is sort of a poison. It's just a poison that poisons the cancer, hopefully more than it, it poisons the host. Uh, but in a time of uh, this contagion that we're all facing, uh, that balance may shift a little bit in that people who are immunocompromised uh, may not do as well if they get uh, COVID infection. There isn't a lot of data about this. The data that we have comes from China. Uh, and there, I've, I've not seen anything in a medical uh, paper, a formal report in the literature, but I've seen information saying that those cancer patients in Wuhan who were infected with COVID had a worse outcome than the average uh, patient uh, with COVID uh, in that area. Uh, and so it raises concerns for all of us about uh, are we uh, treating our cancer and making ourselves susceptible to uh, a severe case of COVID? And how do we balance an immediate threat, that being a viral infection that can result in death, with a less immediate threat, that being a cancer that, uh, while it can eventually have a, a bad result, isn't likely to do that this week or next week or uh, next month uh, for most case, patients who are on chemotherapy. Uh, and so we have more questions than we have answers, but certainly theoretically speaking, uh, ongoing chemotherapy does put people at increased risk of uh, a bad outcome with COVID. Now, not every drug in colon cancer is chemotherapy. Uh, cetuximab and uh, panitumumab are, are targeted therapies. They don't have the same effect on the immune system. We don't usually give a vastin or bevacizumab uh, without chemotherapy, uh, but it also doesn't target the immune system. Uh, and a drug like regorafenib, which is often used in people with uh, fairly advanced disease, is a targeted therapy and not a chemotherapy. So there are some potential alternatives to chemotherapy during this time. The other thing I would say is that uh, colon cancer is a variable disease. Uh, in some patients, it's very aggressive and requires constant chemotherapy pressure to keep it in line. Uh, in other patients, even those with advanced disease, people can have minimal disease. Uh, I'm, bringing to mind one of my patients who's had small pulmonary nodules for more than six years now, who's been on and off of treatment for those, uh, never really been symptomatic of, uh, from them. Uh, and somebody like that uh, could easily take a, a break in the face of uh, the worry about the COVID infection. Uh, without likely jeopardizing their long-term treatment course with their chronic disease, colorectal cancer. Uh, but those are the sorts of conversations you need to have with your medical team. Uh, and I think it's a reasonable question to ask. Uh, for many of you, your only contact with the outside world is going to the uh, infusion area in the clinic uh, where other people are who could potentially infect you? And would you be better off hiding out at home uh, during this time 
uh, and not putting yourself at risk of, of um, being around people who could have COVID and not even know it. So some great points there, uh, Dr. Goldberg. And I think you've clearly reinforced the idea that everybody and everybody's treatment uh, is unique. And, and clearly having that conversation with your own oncologist is, is the priority there. Just as a reflection, I myself, I am on panitumumab. Um, which has created this red face, but it, it, I guess it's the reason that I might be less immunocompromised than others as well. So again, another example of, of, of that uniqueness. Now, navigating colorectal cancer when you've just been diagnosed with a disease is, is daunting enough for, for anybody. And then suddenly you've got this threat of coronavirus T-boning you. But what advice do you have for newly diagnosed patients who just don't know what to tackle first and, and just how to move forward? Well, again, it, it, there's such a broad spectrum of people with colorectal cancer and people with early stage disease, stage two or stage three disease, uh, this could figure into their decision about whether or not to accept what we call adjuvant therapy, the therapy that's given uh, soon after uh, the primary tumor is taken out in people with limited disease. And that's a, a pretty complicated uh, set of decisions. Uh, there are uh, different levels of uh, intensity of chemotherapy that can be considered there that range from just taking capecitabine or Zolota pills to taking uh, Fulfox or Capox, which is uh, adding oxaliplatin to the capecitabine. Uh, the capecitabine is likely to be less immunosuppressive than the two drugs together, uh, and so you could factor that in. In terms of people with advanced disease, uh, you know, it, it really does matter the amount of disease that a person has, the pace of that disease if it's known, uh, how many prior treatments uh, the, the tumors have been exposed to, and, and so it's a very complicated equation. Uh, that takes the expertise of people that really understand what an individual has been through and where they are in the continuum of treatment for colorectal cancer. But again, for example, if that patient that I mentioned with the small lung nodules were to come to me today and say, must I get right on intensive chemotherapy now? I would say, well, an alternative is to wait and watch. Uh, we'll keep an eye on you very closely you may be able to delay uh, starting chemotherapy without affecting the long-term outcomes uh, with your disease. On the flip side, if somebody's got a lot of liver disease or abdominal disease, those are circumstances where we would seldom want to delay. Okay, <clears throat> so again, a very tailored approach uh, down to each patient. Uh, I'd like to share, if I can, some direct questions from the Fight CRC community. And First up is a Fight CRC follower, a male adult, uh, not myself, uh, who has a family history of colorectal cancer and undergoes regular screening. He says, I'm very high risk with a lot of family members who had colon cancer. I've had three colonoscopies, all finding precancerous polyps. My fourth colonoscopy is due next month, but my doctor has just cancelled due to the coronavirus. It makes me nervous to be waiting again. What are your thoughts for this man, Dr. Goldberg, and people awaiting screens and scans in general? Well, so for this individual, uh, it also is a little bit complicated. Uh, you know, the worries regarding doing colonoscopies now are several. One is uh, viruses are little tiny particles. They get all through the body, uh, and it's likely that uh, some of the virus is shed into the stool. Uh, I know that there has been viral DNA detected in stool, but I have not seen any studies uh, that indicate that you could get infected from stool, uh, but it wouldn't seem out of the realm of possibility that you could. So in that circumstance, you're putting uh, the providers of the colonoscopy potentially at risk. Uh, and also the other concern about doing procedures, particularly screening procedures, is that they use 
personal protective equipment. Uh, and as you've read, masks and gowns and uh, all of that protective equipment is in short supply. So for instance, at West Virginia University Hospital, where I was working until the end of December, all elective surgeries have been put on hold. Uh, and the reason for that is not because the hospital is bursting at the seams with uh, COVID patients. Uh, there are only eight patients in the hospital at the moment with that. Uh, but it's because if the, the pandemic really takes off, uh, we're going to need every mask and every gown to protect the healthcare workers that are on the front lines caring for those patients. Uh, now, I, are there any alternatives to colonoscopy? Well, obviously, in someone with a prior history of colon polyps, uh, colonoscopy is the best test. Uh, but there are some alternatives. Uh, one alternative would be virtual colonoscopy, which is a CT scan looking for polyps. Uh, even when polyps form, uh, the natural history of polyps is not generally that it forms and then two months later you have cancer. There's usually a several year lag time, which is why we don't do colonoscopies every three months uh, in people with polyps. So we do them uh, at intervals measured in years. Uh, the other uh, approach that would be potentially useful would be the Cologuard test, which looks for abnormal tumor DNA in stool. Uh, and if that test is negative, uh, it's uh, pretty sensitive uh, at about the 85% level for detecting uh, abnormal DNA associated with polyps in it. And, uh, a lack of uh, a positive test would be reassuring and would allow uh, someone to feel more comfortable about delaying testing. Uh, now, the other problem with virtual colonoscopy, of course, is it means you have to go to the hospital and get in a CAT scanner. Uh, and so you are potentially exposing yourself to other individuals in that circumstance. Um, you know, for this individual, uh, are there other things they can do? Uh, you know, I think it has been shown that uh, uh, exercise, high fiber diet, uh, some people believe that aspirin uh, can reduce the risk of, uh, of colon polyps forming. Uh, this would be somebody I would hope would be on the top of the list once GI uh, diagnostic suites reopen. Uh, and I would uh, keep, keep uh, badgering your doctor to be sure that, uh, uh, that you're uh, on the list when it becomes possible to, to do screening tests again. With respects to scans, again, I think you could, to some degree, individualize that. And somebody who had bulky disease uh, or uh, is just starting treatment, I think it's important to assess. Uh, you know, the blood tests, the CEA or carcinoembryonic antigen can be somewhat uh, reassuring as a surrogate for response uh, if it's going down. Uh, sometimes you could switch from doing a CT scan to just doing a plain chest x-ray if somebody has uh, pulmonary nodules and that would mean less uh, less time in the clinic uh, and, and less exposure. Uh, so again, it, it, you could individualize this. Again, thank you for such a thorough <clears throat> answer, Dr. Goldberg. A great reminder as well of our duty, if you like, to, to wear our masks when, when we are visiting frontline workers who are probably the closest uh, proxy for being immunocompromised right now in terms of the volume of um, exposure that they're, they're, they're under at the moment. So I, I know that uh, the whole CRC community salutes those frontline workers uh, right now. And a great reminder about just some of the alternative approaches that are available uh, from the home, if you like, if, if you can't get in uh, to, to, to be screened. And, and, and I certainly know that I, like many fellow patients, watch those CAA numbers avidly. So I, I totally subscribe to the idea that that is a, a, good, a good proxy for how your, your cancer is performing. I'm gonna to go to a, a sort of chemo related question now, which I think you may have covered uh, as a general point in your opening, but just uh, for the sake of 
repeating the, the, the question. Uh, this is from a colorectal cancer patient who's in treatment and undergoing chemotherapy right now. She says, I've been diligent about social distancing. My visit to the treatment center, as you've just described actually, is pretty much my only exposure to the outside world. So what is the greater risk right now? Delaying treatment to avoid virus exposure or risking virus exposure to continue treatment? Again, I think you've answered this generally, but if you wouldn't mind just targeting this specific question. Um, so I do feel like I've addressed this a bit, and this is something that you really need to discuss with your physician. Uh, but, uh, you know, what I would say is that colorectal cancer, although it may not feel like it some days, is a chronic disease. Uh, it's generally not a disease that, even in the worst of circumstances, gives you a timeline of less than a year from time of diagnosis. Uh, while COVID can take your life within days. Uh, and so, uh, if... Uh, the patient feels that they would like to minimize risk. And if the doctor feels like the uh, place that they're in in their continuum of care is such that they could take a break, now would be a, a time to do that. Uh, you know, I've been a proponent of treatment breaks in, in patients with uh, slow moving disease. Uh, you know, another patient comes to mind who I cared for who would spend his winters in Florida and we would treat him all summer and then he'd go to Florida for the winter and not take any treatment, would just get a scan now and then and come back. And so uh, treatment holidays, if they're timed well, uh, can be both rejuvenating and in this case, uh, spare you exposure. Yeah. Again, great advice. And I, I've... <clears throat> Uh, personal experience of the benefits of a treatment holiday. I had, I had six weeks off last summer and, and uh, rejuvenating is a great way to describe uh, that experience. So again, reinforcing your point that it's about the patient medic dialogue here, but there's some, some great general considerations there for, for everybody. I think like many of us, we're kind of tuned into the media right now and, and different uh, developments afoot. I read yesterday that a panel of experts in the UK has recommended shorter radiotherapy treatments for bowel cancer patients during COVID-19. A truncated one week course of higher density radiotherapy with surgery delayed rather than the usual five weeks of radiation coupled with chemotherapy. The suggestion there was that surgery, which normally occurs one to two weeks following radiotherapy, can safely be delayed up to 12 weeks. Do you have any thoughts to add here? I don't know if you saw the, the, the article. Well, it's, it's somewhat complicated again. So in uh, the Scandinavian countries, uh, they've long given uh, five days of radiation uh, rather than five weeks of radiation, which is more commonly given in the US. When you give the five days, there's no chemotherapy involved. It's a higher dose of radiation with the, each treatment. Uh, and generally, that patient is then pretty quickly taken to surgery. In the US, standardly, we would give chemotherapy with radiation because the two uh, facilitate the uh, anti-cancer effects of each other. But then we would often wait five and sometimes as long as eight weeks before surgery to uh, allow the radiation and chemo to shrink the cancer uh, as much as possible. Sometimes it'll go away completely. And that makes the surgeon's job easier. Uh, and when the surgeon's job is easier, often the uh, after effects of the surgery are uh, less intense. Uh, the question here is, can we do the short course of radiation, but then the longer interval between radiation and surgery uh, that uh, we commonly do with the longer course radiation? And the answer to that is we really don't know. Uh, you know, it, it seems like it would be safe, but in uh, as a clinical trialist in cancer medicine, uh, what seems good isn't always good. Uh, and so, I, I would say if that is the only choice, uh, then so be it. But uh, from my perspective, resection of a rectal cancer is not an elective surgery. 
Yeah. <clears throat> okay, clearly some tough choices and, and risks to be access, uh, assessed by, on all sides uh, th through, through this process. Uh, can we switch perhaps to a potentially tougher subject for, for many in the community, and that's the potential virus impact on clinical trials. Uh, I've read that coronavirus will likely impact over a third of clinical trial sites, a combination of site closures, supply chain interruptions, or site personnel becoming sick themselves with the virus. We've also heard that some trial operators are worried that patients might be less likely to enroll because of their own anxieties about the coronavirus crisis. So there's certainly confusion there. What are your thoughts generally on the impact on clinical trials and your advice for patients perhaps that are holding on for news at the moment? Well, I was just on a, a conference call where I was listening to Ned Sharpless from the National Cancer Institute uh, discuss what's been going on at the NCI. And obviously his message was that job one at the NCI is eradicating cancer and optimizing cancer treatment uh, for people. Uh, but their observation has been that uh, clinical trial accrual has gone down dramatically since the COVID has started. Uh, now, I also uh, serve on the executive committee of the Alliance, which is a clinical trials organization. We are keeping our clinical trials open. We are liberalizing uh, some of the criteria for when treatments need to occur, giving people a few extra days if it's an every 14 day treatment uh, or something like that, uh, so that those are not what we would call protocol violations, but rather exceptional circumstances. Uh, some of the clinical trials that the NCI is funding uh, that are not focused on uh, survival outcomes uh, have been put on hold. So some of the quality of life research and, uh, and other things uh, are not accruing patients uh, at the moment, but many of the trials continue to be open for accrual and particularly for childhood cancers where protocol treatment we know saves more lives than off protocol treatment. Uh, and for people that are trying to get access to novel therapeutics where there's no alternative, uh, we still are trying to enroll patients as much as we can. Uh, I do think that there will be a, a temporary slowing of our progress uh, uh, as a consequence of this, uh, but uh, this is the more emergent reality. No, thank you for that. I think there's a mixture of hope and reality there, but certainly sounds like you're keen to stay the course as much as possible around uh, offering trials and, and working them through for the community. And I would certainly say that those individuals who are on trials should try as best they can to maintain uh, the protocol that they signed up for so that we don't lose the learning that they can provide uh, for the benefit of both of themselves and other patients. Uh, very clearly put, thank you. <clears throat> now, a couple of questions from me, I think, on behalf of those of us who've been lucky enough to achieve remission from metastatic colorectal cancer that still undergo maintenance therapy to prevent recurrence. Uh, I know you've mentioned that some therapies actually might not uh, induce the same level of immunocompromisation, uh, but I just wonder if you had some general advice for um, maybe immunotherapy patients or maintenance patients relative to patients who are still in full treatment for active cancer. Well, as I've made the point before, I think this is an individualized decision and maintenance therapy can be interrupted uh, safely in many patients. And so if that's where you are, uh, that's a consideration. Now, you've told us you're on panitumumab. Uh, you know, panitumumab is not immunosuppressive, and so there's less of a worry for you there. Uh, in terms of the immuno-oncology drugs, that's a whole nother story. So what those drugs do is actually augment the immune system rather than suppress it. Uh, and uh, one of the concerns about that is that people who get coronavirus who do badly with it have what we call cytokine storm. So what that, is, what that means is that the messengers in the body 
uh, that our the way the body responds to viral infection. It causes you to get fevers and muscle aches and uh, fatigue uh, are triggered by COVID. And in some cases, they're triggered in a way that cause this uh, respiratory failure. Uh, nobody really knows whether uh, the immuno-oncology drugs would enhance the likelihood of getting that so-called cytokine storm or not. Uh, and so uh, I, I, one of my other roles is I'm the editor for Up to Date, which is a medical online textbook that many doctors rely on. And, and we just deliberated about this uh, as an expert group of uh, commentators. Uh, and what our recommendation was, was that individuals who are on the immuno-oncology drug should certainly stop them at the first sign of a, uh, either a, a diagnosed case of coronavirus or a suspected case of coronavirus uh, and wait until those symptoms have abated uh, before resuming. Uh, their treatments. Uh, so uh, we don't really have any data from China on that. And so we're working in a dataless world for the moment. I, again, I, I think you're illustrating how different the conversation might be in a world where you're in treatment and trying to avoid coronavirus. And, and then, and then uh, if, if actually you take on uh, the virus itself and you're diagnosed uh, positive for coronavirus, that's a very different conversation at that point with your medic in terms of uh, how to tackle certain things. Is that a fair summary? Yes, it is. And again, you know, they, you're dealing with a chronic disease, colorectal cancer versus an acute disease. Uh, and the, uh, the curves that we've all seen with the steep rise and the rising number of deaths are all, I think, uh, very uh, upsetting and, and uh, I encourage us to take coronavirus very seriously. Yeah, well, I think there's, there's a loud message here, Dr. Gobo, that that's treat the acute, treat the disease that's right in front of you uh, at the moment. As, as we look forward to this summer, look forward as a, phrase I'd use advisedly, of course, given the current circumstances. But um, there is a hope that the good weather will suppress the virus, but that it may actually return again with colder weather in the fall and winter. Is there something in the interim that uh, colorectal cancer patients can do to actually boost their immune system so that if um, they, are, they, are, they come back stronger or less immunocompromised uh, during that fall period? Well, there's the possibility of treatment breaks, and then there's the possibility of using a targeted therapy rather than a chemotherapy uh, for treatment. Uh, the other big hope that we all have is that there will be a vaccine for this. Uh, you know, the, the worry is that coronavirus isn't going to disappear. It's going to uh, take a nap, uh, if you will. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the real uh, solution to it is, is a vaccine rather than an avoidance strategy. Uh, and I, as I understand it, uh, uh, the federal government here in the US is investing heavily in vaccine research and in COVID research. Uh, you know, we recently got a directive uh, from our, our research leadership at West Virginia University saying any ideas on COVID related research, there's funding available, uh, so submit, submit ideas. Well, again, I think you're expressing a, a hope on behalf of all of us that, that this uh, crisis comes to a speedy end uh, and certainly a vaccine is the, is, is the best way to put a stop to that. So uh, thank you very much for that. I'm just getting note of another question that's coming in, if you just indulge me for a moment. So uh, the question says, I would be interested in Dr. Goldberg's opinion regarding use of other immunosuppressives. I had recently restarted Humira or Humira to treat my underlying arthritis and IBD and elected to stop it because of fear of both corona and tumor growth 
triggered by the biologic. Is that something you're able to offer a point of view on? Well, my knowledge about that is, is uh, not particularly strong because I don't use Humira. Uh, I would say again that uh, the, the target of Humira uh, is not uh, antibody producing cells, uh, the T cells in the body, uh, but rather it's a, a TNF uh, antagonist. Uh, and at least theoretically, uh, TNF is one of the cytokines responsible for cytokine storm. Uh, and so just as perhaps hydroxychloroquine might protect people from the uh, respiratory failure that accompanies some cases of coronavirus, it's possible that Umera could do that as well. But I'm theorizing, I'm not speaking from the point of view of any data. Okay, well, I think that's a, an, an excellent answer, all the same, given you don't have the background, so appreciated. And if the viewer has any uh, follow-up, please, please drop a note to us at Fight Colorectal Cancer, and we'll do our best to get you a, a bigger explanation, if required. Dr. Goldberg, your advice and time today is just massively appreciated by myself, by Fight Colorectal Cancer, and the community that's tuned in to listen to you. We'll certainly be taking advantage of all the answers that you've given us and, and make those more widely available uh, to the community that might not have been tuned in. So I really do appreciate and value the time that you've spent with us today. I'm looking forward personally to getting to know you uh, as a board member of, of Fight Colorectal Cancer. And I think that the, the, the wisdom and experience that you can bring to this community is just uh, uh, truly, truly welcome. So thank you very much for all your time today. Do you have any parting thoughts or words that you would like to close on before we shut down the, the Q&A for today? Well, I, I appreciate being involved in this and I just wanna remind everybody that we're all in the fight together. It's a great way to close. Thank you, uh, Rich Goldberg, and uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. All the best.